Nevertheless, though, it doesn't change the fact that these things, as I've emphasized multiple times, we need a lot. We, we need to discuss the nuance behind things for, for to get to your point, to get your point about averages, how misleading they can be. This is a basic statistical fact. You learn this in statistics. You, 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 you learn what an average is. It's, a, it's sort of the balance point of your data. Okay. You understand that you understand when to, you learn when to report the median or the mean, because sometimes you get a, a lot of variation or really a lot of uh, a skew in your data. But he, the one thing that I always, I, I, it cracks me up because if people just understood this one fact, they would think they, it would open up a whole new world of logical deduction and they would, they, they would just be able to understand things a lot better. Uh, specifically in this regard, relevant to this is the HbA1c value, the average blood glucose reading over the course of two to four months. The standard deviation, the variance around the average. What is the variability? What is the dispersion around the average? When you report an average in statistics, if you don't report a standard deviation alongside that, any data analyst, any statistician will look at that and go, I need more. I need more than just an average, man. And so what do I mean by this? Well, you can have two groups Let's say that you're looking at the average sugar consumption in the groups per day. One group can be exhibiting, they could be like fully identical. Let's say that in a world where you could just repeat the study over again in the same group of people, you can time travel, go back in time, do it again. And you could do two, a study on two groups of people that are completely identical to each other. And one group says, oh, well, it, it shows that their average blood glucose or not blood glucose, but sugar intake is 200 grams a day. And group two the average is also 200. Okay, well, it looks like, oh, well, they have the same average sugar intake. It's totally fine. Uh, they're basically the same. Except then you put the standard deviation right next to it, the variance, like plus or minus what? What is the variance around that? Well, one group, group, group one, can be 200 plus or minus 20. Yeah. The other group can have 200 plus or minus 200. It's like, Oh, well, that's a totally different picture then. There's a lot of variability in the second group compared to the first one. And so this is, this is exactly what your point is about the HbA1c. You've got the same average, but the variance is nothing. It's almost nothing in the carnivores that you're observing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. This is coming from people that you deal with. Like yeah, these, are, these are blood. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you've seen this. You've witnessed this. You've observed this. And so if people just understood that one fact, I mean, it kind of just undermines the whole argument that the, the, the reductionist argument of you could just, it's sufficient to look at an HbA1c value in isolation. Done. Slam dunk. Oh, well, you're going up to 5.7% HbA1c. You know, I mean, this is people, I, I think, I think that people just neglect to understand that they, they neglect to mention nuance, but it's not even just a matter of ne failing to understand it. They don't have a desire to understand it because I think this really gets into the main heart, the, 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 the heart of this, which is. It seems that every single person is, is looking for an excuse to add in that fruit, add back in that honey, add back in the maple syrup or whatever it may be, potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice. And I think, I think that's what it is deeply rooted in, whether they realize it or not. I think it's way more, it's, it's way easier to see that from the outside looking in than it is for the, the addicts themselves. Like yeah, I've I never, think, yeah, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I think, I think also there's a lot of, if, if you keep hearing that the HbA1c going up is, is a problem, you start to worry. And then um, the, the people that I have watched the videos of, they definitely under eat. That's a big yep. that's likely to make them gain weight. That's definitely true. And they have no joined up thinking. I just want to go back to the mean, the average and stuff like that and the st statistical power and everything. Um, yep. The example I always use, and I, this is... Uh, one of the things that I was taught very early on was you can have nine Americans sitting at the bar and you can say, what is their average income? And it's a hundred thousand dollars. And Bill Gates comes and sits on the end and you then say, what's the average there? And yeah, apparently the average American will be earning $335,000 million. You know, it's, so yeah. it, it, it's, it's all about looking at the actual details, the power of the, of the study that you've done it's because People don't understand those phrases. So that American thing, if you took the city of New York and added Bill Gates afterwards, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. Actually, it still would because he's earning, earning yeah, an right. extraordinary amount of money. But, you know, we have to look at the way we eat and what we need and physiological uh, parameters that we actually understand. 
I mean, the latest thing I've just seen is the uh, polyol pathway. Oh, we don't want to elicit the polyol pathway. My blood glucose was 105 milligrams per deciliter. Well, you won't elicit it. Just do a, I mean, honestly, I did a Google search. It took me 30 seconds to find out when does the polyol pathway become a problem? And that's at seven milligrams per liter, which I knew anyway, 126 milligrams per deciliter. So this person is thinking about changing the way they eat because someone has said, oh, you don't want to elicit that uh, because when you're at 105 milligrams per deciliter, that's a problem. It isn't. And it, this is what gets me. None of the information is actually based on studies, statistical analysis that are, that are known and accepted. And it's also taken from people who are eating a lot of carbs. So I think on carnivore, all those numbers are actually going to be slightly higher. But even with mm -hmm. the bad numbers with, and the numbers that they are using to justify stuff, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I think the terminology um, is, is really important as well. I'm not denying their experience. If they eat some carbs and they feel better, well, that's, that's maybe a temporary gain. If they're losing weight, uh, that's fine. But I think that might be down to the fact that they were under eating. And now they're eating more. It might be down to the fact they're hydrating more, so their mineral fluid balance is improving. But it's not adding the carbs. It's not adding the carbs. It's, it's what you were doing before. You need to look at, you know, you need a bigger bolus of protein. Maybe that will elicit a blood glucose response, not via the protein so much, but as uh, cholecystic kinase will um, come from the small intestine. Tell the alpha cells we need some glucagon. Put the blood glucose Bump up, it up. And, yeah, yeah. And, and then that will get an insulin response. Well, we are always saying, I think you're, you're the same as me, you need to eat an adequate bowl of protein. And these mm -hmm. people maybe weren't. They were eating too much fat. So yeah. you have problems. It's a change in macro ratio. That's it. Yeah.